Welcome back. I'm Pastor Chris Titus, and today we're going to talk about dry faith. The idea that our relationship with God can get a little stale sometimes and ways that we can avoid that uh, from happening. And so uh, we'll talk about that, but let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you when we recognize because of the busyness of our lives, because of the world around us, we often drift away from you and sometimes our faith becomes less than fresh. And so we uh, want to come before you today and just have you renew us and restore us in a way that is uh, not only helpful to us immediately, but in the days ahead. And so uh, we want to honor you with words and music today, and we just ask you to allow us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I want to talk about fear. Uh, most of us are afraid of something. It could be heights. It could be spiders. It might be the dark. Um, it might be blood. Some of us are afraid of clowns. My wife is deathly afraid of mice. For me, it's deep water. But whatever we have for those fears, each of us probably has one or two. And the church also should have a fear. And that is something that I'm going to refer to as dry faith where our faith becomes something less than passionate for Jesus Christ and it becomes more stale and maybe uh, more ritualistic. And so we're going to talk about that today and talk about how we might uh, refresh our relationship with God a little bit. Uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist denomination, was asked near the end of his life if he had any great fears about the, uh, the movement that he had started, the people called Methodists. And he said, um, my fear is essentially that they would become a dead sect. In other words, a religious group, but not a relationship or passionate group for Jesus Christ. And so dry faith is something that churches should uh, be concerned about, be afraid of. Uh, this is when we're kind of going through the motions of worship uh, and activity and ministry. We've not really figured out what our mission is, and so we, we simply don't leave the building. We don't really try to reach out to others. Uh, we're missing energy, and we've sort of forgotten what attracted us to a relationship with God to begin with. And we all go back and think about our time of conversion. For some of us, that was immediate. For others, it was over a period of time. That's kind of how mine went. And we remember how loved and cherished we felt by God when we first learned how God so loved the world in the sending of Jesus Christ. And so we've lost that passion maybe when our faith becomes a little bit dry. We've, we've forgotten about that. We can remember times that God has uh, been very present in our lives, very much the focal point of what we're doing and what we're seeing, and whether that has been because of answered prayer or because uh, God was with us in a difficult journey uh, during this life, or whether it's because of blessings. Whatever it may be, we can remember how enthusiastically, maybe even emotionally, we responded to God. And that's when our faith is, is really uh, alive and vibrant. And then, of course, the opposite of that is when our faith begins to get uh, stale and dry. And so we have to think about when this happens individually in us, what steps do we take to get back towards God? And then what happens when it, ha it occurs in a church? When a church has dry faith, what does that look like? And how do we change that? Now, maybe individually right now, you're in kind of a desert time in your relationship with God. You're not praying very much or you're infrequently. Uh, you're not really reading scripture. You're not attending church much at all. And this has led you to a position where you feel far away from God. Now, I think it's pretty clear from the way I've just described that, that those actions are not because of God. They tend to be because of you, uh, because how you are relating to God in the activities uh, that we would consider to be worship or trying to deepen our faith. And then it could be because of other circumstances. Maybe you blame other people that your relationship with God is strained or difficult because of their sins put upon you. So I'm going to describe this today, this dry faith as having a uh, D 
dehydrated heart. We know what dehydration is. We've heard of it in the physical sense. If we're out working in the yard this week, I was doing that. It was pretty warm out, 90 degrees or so. And um, I didn't drink a lot of water. So what it tended to happen was I got tired. I got a little sore. Um, I was dehydrated and I felt this uh, lack of energy. What happens when we don't drink enough water? Well, our body starts to shut down over time uh, and we suffer a little bit because of that and really nothing good happens when we are dehydrated. The same is sort of true uh, by analogy with regard to our spiritual life. We can become spiritually dehydrated or have dry faith. We've not quenched ourselves in Christ. We have not stayed connected to God in prayer, or we have not uh, looked at our Bibles. We've, we're not attending church because we're so busy doing other things. And just like when we fail to take in enough water, uh, bad things begin to happen. Our mind, body, and soul begins to shut down. We suffer a little bit because of that. And so we have to remember that any relationship is healthy when it has good communication, and positive actions taking place. And this is the same with our relationship with God. We need to make sure that we keep it healthy, keep it hydrated. And so I challenge you to ask yourself the question, what's my hydration status with God right now? Does God feel far away from me? Am I not really communicating with him? Am I not taking positive actions in my relationship with him? Whatever it may be. Are there ways that I can determine how I could get back closer to God? Well, certainly. One of the ways is to stay connected to the church. Part of what the church does is keep us in rhythm with God, keep us hydrated, keep us quenched. At church, we, we um, read the word, we preach the word, we pray the word, we study the word. All of it is to keep us in rhythm with God so that we uh, don't develop dry faith. If you think back to the Old Testament, a great example of this is Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, in that particular book, chapter 37, there's a discussion about God telling Ezekiel about this valley of dry bones. And he's really saying to him, this, this is Israel in their relationship with me. So God can bring life to dry bone. And this is true sometimes of our relationship with God. It's like dry bones. We don't thirst for Christ. We don't keep our prayer life hydrated. We don't stay in communication with God. We don't go to church. Whatever the case may be, we've begun to drift away from God and we find ourselves in the desert with very dry faith. And so Jesus talked about this in a slightly different context, but from this passage we can see how we might be able to um, revive our faith a little bit. Uh, bring some life to our dry faith. Take a look at John 7, beginning in verse 37. Jesus uh, is with uh, his disciples, and he points out something to the crowd. It reads, On this, the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Streams of living water will flow from within him. So when our lives are a confusing mess, when we have gotten ourselves in situations we wish we hadn't, when we are lonely, when we are discouraged, when we are frustrated and our faith is dry, how do we refresh that relationship with God? Well, we return back to Christ. We go back to Jesus to drink again from those living waters. We step away from the loneliness and confusion and fear, and we immerse ourselves in Jesus Christ. Now, in this particular passage, when Jesus is talking about living water, of course, he's referring to salvation. But I would point out that this is an um, invitation for us to return to the well of Christ on a regular basis, like a thirsty person seeking water. This is what we're really looking for. This is what Jesus told the woman at the well. There is living water in your relationship with God. 
And I said earlier, this doesn't just happen, this idea of dry faith doesn't just happen to us individually, it happens to the church as well. Spiritual deficiencies in the church leads the congregation to be more into the ritual and not into the relationship with Christ. And rituals, of course, can be good. They have benefit. They remind us of how we are to worship God. Maybe they remind us of a time when we were closer to God. But churches can get too much into rituals, and it lacks the passion, and it's very rigid, and it's not a way to revive us from dry faith when those types of things occur. Rituals can be unchanging. So we have to avoid falling into a situation where the church always does things a certain way, and so they check the box that they are doing church, but it's really not anything that keeps us hydrated, that keeps us um, connected to God, and that's something that the church should be very afraid of. It, it is the truth that we are in relationship with the Lord. We are not in ritual with the Lord. And so we have to underscore that. The church has to be concerned about dry faith. So in a congregation, in a church, what does that look like? Well, almost always dry faith in a church is timid faith. And a great illustration of that is given to us uh, by Jesus when he talks about uh, uh, the living water and also in the illustration that we see when Jesus is walking on water. And usually when this occurs, it's because there is, a, there is a need for us to see a miracle. And so the Gospel of John points out this miracle relating to Jesus walking on water. But I think that we need to think of it in terms of what does a hydrated church look like, a spiritually active church. We're getting ready to come out of the coronavirus pandemic, one of the worst plagues uh, that has hit our nation, and regardless of where you are politically on this thing, unfortunately it got politicized, but wherever you may be on that, you cannot deny that that particular coronavirus situation has changed our world. Like it or not, it has changed the way we do things and the way we see things. And so as Christians, we're returning to a world that is radically different um, than it was in March of 2020, not so long ago. And so individually and as a church, we have to respond different. We can't just do church as usual. We have to change with the changing times. How we do ministry needs to change is what I'm getting at. And so as we move closer to the fall of 2021 and we start to uh, return to a normal life, if you want to refer to it that way, even though the world is quite different than it was just a year or so ago, as we return to that, we have to start thinking about what can we do as a church to interact with this new world. And so over the next few months, we'll be talking about that. But churches have to adjust. They have to make adjustments, and the coronavirus has happened, and that's kind of changed the way we do things. And so we have to rehydrate our church. And we should be well-rested because the church got shut down or suspended uh, for periods of time, and that was very frustrating for everyone. But... I started this sermon by saying that, that one of the things that we should be afraid of as a church is dry faith. And we need to think about this. And I mentioned personally that I'm afraid of deep water. And of course, for me, deep water is a scary thing because I don't know what's underneath. And this slide will illustrate exactly what I mean by that. When I see deep water, I see sharks. And so... We have to think about this. My wife can't get me on, a, on an ocean cruise because that's the way I see the world. But when fear overcomes us in a congregational sense, it has to do with the dry bones of faith that may be existing in a church. And so I use this example of Jesus walking on water. It's a very familiar passage. Uh, it occurs in Matthew 14. And we know this story. Jesus is off on the hillside praying, and the disciples are out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and it's at night, and there aren't any lights around the lake because obviously uh, no electricity in this uh, time frame. And so it's very dark, and Jesus begins to walk on water towards the boat. 
And of course, the disciples see this and they are afraid. They think he is a ghost and he senses their fear. And so he calls out to them. Take a look at Matthew 14, beginning in verse 27. But Jesus said to them, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, if I'd been in that particular boat at that time and I saw a man walking on water, I would be afraid. I would not know what was going on. So I think Jesus' response uh, telling me not to be afraid uh, makes sense when you read it in that context. But here's Peter. He's in the very same boat. He sees Jesus walking on water. And instead of being afraid, he responds, Lord, if it is you, call me out onto the water. So Jesus calls him and Peter steps out of the boat. And Peter starts to walk towards Jesus in the darkness, even though there's deep water below him. He's walking towards him and he gets closer to Christ step by step. And so I want to read this passage and, and show you what happens next. Matthew 14, beginning in verse 30. But when he, Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When he climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. So we've got this context. There's a story. Jesus is walking on water. There's a, kind of a storm going on. They're afraid in the boat. They're not only afraid of the elements around them, but also of Jesus walking on water. And we know that Peter steps out of the boat. Now, most of the time this passage is preached, it's focused on Peter and what he did in, and, and then what he failed to do. He took his eyes off Jesus, is sometimes how this is preached, and he began to sink, and then Jesus reached down and saved him. And that's a totally reasonable way to, to preach that, by the way. But I want to focus on something completely different today. I, I don't want to focus on Peter. I want to focus on the other 11 who are in the boat. At least Peter got out of the boat and started to walk. The other 11... 11 uh, did not. They stayed where they were. So let's consider those other believers and what they are not doing. So they also hear the voice of Jesus telling them not to be afraid. And what is their response? Nothing. They don't move. Why? Well, they're probably afraid for sure. Maybe they're afraid of getting wet, maybe they're afraid of what's going to happen next and it's uncertain and, they're, and they have anxiety about that. Maybe they're afraid of drowning. Uh, maybe they're just fishermen who say, uh, we don't do it this way. We stay in the boat. For whatever reason, they don't follow Peter. They stay put. And so to me, this is an example of timid faith. Peter's faith was small but it was greater than those who stayed in the boat. And so dry faith or timid faith is a faith that is uh, wanting to stay pat and not really change or move or do anything. And this is a major issue in the church as far as I'm concerned. And that is why churches suffer from stale faith at times. We hear Jesus calling, but we don't respond to what Jesus is calling us to do. And as a leader, um, I felt like Peter before. I've made recommendations and climbed out of the boat. No one followed me. It's lonely out there when you're by yourself. People really don't want to change. They don't want to try new things. They want to simply Focus on what could happen. Well, we might drown, or this ministry might cost us money, or we might um, do things the way we haven't done before. After all, we're fishermen, and we stay in the boat. This is the way it's done. So for whatever reason, churches with dry faith or timid faith uh, aren't interested really in walking with Jesus, and this is the assumption that they're going to be walking alone in the water when, in fact, that's not the case at all. If anything, this passage illustrates that Jesus is there for us to reach down and grab us as he did with Peter. So as individuals, uh, we can think of most recently the mountaintop trip that was taken by some uh, 
young people and adults, went down to Tennessee and did some ministry work there. This is an example of stepping out of the boat. This is an example of trying to exercise their faith, trying to keep their faith hydrated so that they can draw closer to God. And the church needs to venture out of its comfort zone too. For the very survival of the church, that needs to be done uh, for the ministry of Jesus Christ. Christian author John Orkberg once wrote a book aptly titled, You Can't Walk on Water If You Don't Get Out of the Boat. Makes perfect sense. The idea that we need to get out of our comfort zone, we need to take risks. We can respond to Jesus' calling only if we move, only if we act, only if we recognize, hey, this is maybe not the way we've done it before, but we're going to try something different. So instead of being huddled in fear, we want to be able to get out and do ministry. So whether that's individually, drawing closer to God in every way that we can, or whether it's as a body of believers trying to find a way to get out of the boat, to get out of the pews, to get out of the church building, whatever it may be, we need to look for those ways. We need to think about how can I expand my relationship with God? How can I deepen my faith? How can I love my neighbor, both individually and as a congregation? And as a church, our rallying cry really needs to be, everybody out of the boat. We're serving the Lord. We're ministering to others. We're sharing the gospel. Whatever it might be, we need to make sure that we participate because that's when miracles actually happen. Sometimes people forget that Peter walked on water, maybe only for a few steps, but it was a miracle in and of itself. And so let's try to combat dry faith individually and as a church through figuring out ways to rehydrate our faith. And so over the next few weeks, we will talk just about that in ways that might be encouraging to you. Until then, be blessed. There is a music video attached to this, and I hope you enjoy it. Take care.